So what we're doing today um, is we are going to replace our demo data that we created and then duplicated last week so that we could practice uh, debugging our pagination. And we're going to replace it with an API call that will give us a list of random products. And once we have that list, we're going to go ahead and update our existing components, our product listing, um, since there will be a few properties that are different, since their data is represented a different way than we're going to represent it. And um, we're also going to actually incorporate the discount, which is something that we had put onto our, our data, but we haven't done anything with it. And we'll just add a couple of small little CSS stylings as a preview of a couple of weeks from now. Um, so that it's a little bit more manageable and things aren't too big or too small. So shouldn't be pretty, pretty simple. Um, we'll go a little bit slower than last week. And I think that's everything that I have planned. Does anyone have any questions about what we're going to get into? Any suggestions? OK. In that case. I'm going to go ahead and drop some links in the Zoom chat as usual. If you want to follow along, um, you're more than welcome to work alongside or just watch whatever you would prefer. All right. So the link to grab this project, if you don't already have it, is in the Zoom chat. I already have it on my desktop. So I'm going to open a terminal session. And open the project from there. All right, great. So the second link that's going to be useful today is an API that I found that just has a bunch of different products in a database. And you can do a bunch of different things with that. So I'm going to open it up over here so you guys can see what I'm looking at. All right. So fake store API um, is useful with any shopping project. And it can handle a bunch of different things. So it has just some products stored up. It has its own cart data. We already implemented a cart locally, so we're not going to touch that. And also, you could uh, handle users. So um, most of the features that this offers are CRUD features. CRUD is an acronym, um, C-R-U-D, CRUD. Create, update, sorry. Um, I don't actually know what R stands for now that I think about it. But this is a acronym that just sort of describes the basic features of any app that deals with objects of some kind, whether it be users or products or carts. Um, you can create a user. You can update a user. You can delete a user. You can edit a user. All of these get incorporated. And these are very standard features that pretty much everything offers. And this API allows us to do that with all of these different objects, both products and carts and users. Um, it doesn't actually modify at the source wherever this is being hosted, but you can send a request and it'll send you back a response as if that thing has happened. Um, so you can still test out your application, make sure that everything works. For our purposes, the only thing we really care about is just getting our list of products. In the real world, um, either us or some other people or some combination would be working on a backend that actually hosts the database and contains all of our products and performs all the updates when you submit new products and handles all of our different API features. We don't have that. So we're going to plug it in here um, and use the features available from this API. And the one that looks really useful to me, browsing through here of all the things we can do, is getting all of our products. Eventually, once we implement um, some different pages, which I think we'll do next week, um, since React Router is part of next week, and I don't want to touch class components, which are the other half. But uh, right now, 
I find that there's um, there's a route here where we can get all of our products and it returns all of them at once. So this is what we're going to target. And for a real API, um, let's look for a couple different options here. API Explorer. No, this isn't good. Okay, so for, for a real API that we'd be getting, there's usually a lot more information than what's available here. For our fake store API, all it gives us is the route that we need to send it to, because that's all we're doing. We're just running a GET request. There's no need to authenticate ourselves to provide any credentials or anything like that, which usually is what most of this documentation comes from. But in this case, a real API would give us what exactly we have to send in and specific information about um, like what the data types are, what the fields are, and also somewhere it would give us information about what our credentials need to be. We don't have any of that. All we're gonna do is just send a GET request and then uh, deal with that. Okay, so with all the talking out of the way, we can go ahead and actually jump into things here. So right now, if I go into our listings page, our listings page is where our products reside and we duplicate them many, many times so that we have a very large number of products and then we filter them down um, using our search bar. So we're gonna take this out. We're gonna replace our duplication with just grabbing all the products from it. Okay, so first steps, I'm gonna go ahead and open my uh, terminal inside of VS Code here. I am going to create a new branch and let's call this products fetch. And we're going to fetch all of our products from this branch. We can check it out. And now we can start working. So uh, one of the other features of lesson 1.8, or I think it's actually lesson 1.9, which is starting this week, is using other third-party libraries through Node. So we're gonna go ahead and do that just for some practice. There is a package on NPM called Axios. And Axios is a promise-based, there's a summary somewhere. Why isn't the summary up here? Anyway, Axios is a package that allows us to make HTTP requests using a little bit of alternate syntax, which uh, some people will find just a little bit nicer. I personally enjoy using it. But it also fills an issue where on older browsers, we don't use the fetch API because the fetch API wasn't available on like very old versions of all these different browsers. And if we were to be using those browsers, our website would need to check first to see what the version is. And if it's a version before the fetch API existed, use a completely different syntax to fetch. And then if we are past that version, use the fetch API instead. So we'd be writing the same thing twice, basically. And that's not super sustainable. There's other options uh, like a polyfill, which sort of like patches uh, deficiencies in JavaScript, which would also work, but um, Axios just handles all that for us and provides some alternate syntax. I personally enjoy using Axios, so we're gonna use it here. Um, and we'll kind of talk about how it all works. So first thing we're gonna do is we need to actually install this to our project. So our project, uh, if we go into our package.json, currently has a bunch of dependencies that were installed when we created our React application and nothing else. It has information about the versioning, whatever, and this dependency section where React is being used, React DOM and React scripts. React scripts allow us to call npm start and npm build and do all of this stuff automatically. And then React and React DOM handle all of the um, 
background stuff to actually make our React project work. So in order to install a new package um, that you find from npm.js, which is the registry of all the different packages, we're going to run npm install, or in this case, you can shorten it to just npm i, and then the name of your package. If you wanted a specific version, you can specify an exact version. Um, I think the syntax is using at and then the version number, but I might be confusing this with a different language. Um, but because we just want the most updated version that fits with all of our other stuff, we're not going to add a version. And this will run for a little bit. Should be pretty quick. It's not a huge package. And it will go ahead and automatically add it as a dependency, which is great. And it'll add us to our package.lock and our node modules. Um, should be somewhere in here. Axios, great. There's a lot of stuff in here. This is all React basics. OK, so we have Axios. And now we can use it wherever we want in our project. So let's start by um, going to the source of where all of, all of our products are and update it from there. So right now we have a bunch of these different products. I'm going to take out two of them and our array. And I'm going to comment out this last one so that we still have the structure of what our product needs to be on hand. And what we're going to do is we're going to take out this duplicated product section, because right now uh, we don't have an API, but we're implementing it right now. And we're going to replace this with um, a function. And this function is just going to get all of our products from our API whenever we decide to call the function. So let's call this get all products. And we don't need to pass anything in. There's no, um, there's no query parameters. A query parameter would be if there's a question mark at the end and you can pass like key value pairs to the API, which tells what am I actually looking for when I'm running this get request. This API doesn't support that anywhere. Down here, this is a query parameter. If we were trying to get um, just a limited number of results instead of everything, then we could say to the API, give me only five or give me seven, whatever we want. Since there's no query parameters, no credentials or anything, um, we don't need to pass anything into this function. And um, now we're just going to run the actual Axios. So we can go ahead and import Axios directly. But um, for most packages, if you just type out what you want, once it's installed, it'll auto-complete and auto-import for you. So I have Axios imported. Let's go back to the documentation here. So this is a get request. We are getting all of our products. It's not a post. It doesn't explicitly say in here what the method is. And so the default is a get. And so we're going to look and see how we can do a get request with Axios. If I can get this zoom bar out of the way. All right. So if I scroll down here, it tells us how to install it, how to import it. Um, and then example usage down here. This looks like what I want here. Make a get request to a specific route. So this, you might notice here that this doesn't have a URL in front. When you have an application uh, that's running both your front end and your back end together, which is how most things are bundled together, your back end handles all the API routes. And then if you go to the home route, it'll actually open your front end. And then your front end can handle all of your, your different page routing from there. If we were running them both on the same server, then we can go ahead and use this syntax where we get from a API route on our base URL, which is where the base URL is just where you can access the server from. But because we're going to a different origin, meaning like a different server, we need to actually use the entire URL here. 
So we're going to do axios.get. We can pass it the URL. Um, you'll notice that we can also pass config options here. We don't have any config options, so we're not going to do anything crazy. Um, does it show us our config here? Request config. So we could pass in an object that has all of our different um, configuration options, but we don't need any headers. We don't have to tell the server anything. So we're going to leave it like this. And once we get this, this is a promise. So if I hover over this, it returns back a promise with the response object. So we can do this whatever way we want. We could declare this an async function. And then we could await, or we could do dot then, whatever you prefer. I'm gonna go ahead and use await just because it doesn't really matter here. Um, and when we use this await syntax, this could potentially throw an error. And instead of writing a catch block, um, we need to actually do a try catch here. And then let's do console.error with our error message. And we can move this into our try block. All right, so now we have all of our different products. And I don't have any idea what this is going to look like. That's a lie. I do actually know what this is going to look like. But let's pretend that I didn't. So let's go ahead, before we do anything else, let's log out this response object and figure out what the structure is and what we need to do in order to actually get all of our data. So duplicated products here doesn't match. There's a couple more things we need to do before this actually works. Um, if we want to get all of our products, what do you think would be a good way to call this function? Should we have like a button on the page? Should we use like a React structure of some kind? What do you guys think would be best here? Uh, buttons? I don't know. So we want these products to be shown in the homepage, so. Mm -hmm. Can we use it in the use effect to fetch it for the first time? Yes, I like that plan. We only need to do this one time. Once we have all of our products, like it's not going to change unless our page gets refreshed and you know things have changed in the meantime. Um, but we only have to do this once. So I think the best thing here would be to put this in a use effect that runs when the page loads, and that's it. So let's do that. Use effect and we'll run some sort of function. And let's specify an empty dependency array, which says do this when the page loads. And we can just call get all products. Uh, one interesting thing to note here, if I try to await this, it's going to tell me there's an error because I have to do this in an async function. So I could go ahead and do that. I could make this an async function. But then React gets mad at me for something else. Effect callbacks are synchronous. And you should not try and make the callback function of a use effect asynchronous, because it can cause a bunch of different issues under the hood for React. So what it suggests is define an asynchronous function and then just call it, which executes you know, as slow or as fast as it wants and doesn't actually hold up. This use effect just ends immediately. And whatever happens behind the scene happens. Um, so we can't like await and make this an async. We're doing the same thing. We have an asynchronous function, which returns you know whatever, and we're just going to let it run. We're just going to call it. So this looks good to me. Um, we don't actually have any data right now, so I'm going to replace this duplicated products with just an empty array. And that will take away uh, a bunch of our errors. And let's take duplicated products out down here. And once we have all of our errors gone, let's npm start and try and figure out what does this response actually look like. Oftentimes, these API pages will also have a way that you can um, either see what's coming back. It'll give you all the different properties. or in this case, we can show the output, which shows us the structure. So these are what the objects look like. 
we still don't actually know what this response object looks like because this is Axios giving us a response object. So if we go ahead and inspect and go into our console, all right, this is pretty nasty. So we have a configuration property, which again is just all the settings that allow our request to go through and headers and request and a status. And then we have data. All right, you know why this looks weird? It's because I sent a GET request to just the documentation page itself. And so what it's giving me back is the HTML available at that page. This is like if I went to that page in the browser, this is the HTML that I get back. And this is not what we want. We actually want to grab this product, which is an API route. So let's do this. Let's refresh our page. And now we get back. This looks a little better. So we have a data property. And inside of our data property is the array with all of our different products. Looks like it only gives us back 20. So we're gonna have a pretty small set, but that's okay. And all of these are different things. And these have different properties like a category, description, ID, image, price, rating, title. So we'll look at that in a second. So once we have our response object, uh, let's just run one more check to be safe. If res.status is not equal to 200, 200 was our success error code, then let's row error received um, so we'll go ahead and print out our status code in our data and then we also need to return. Oh, no, we don't need to return. If we throw an error here, it's gonna exit out of this try block and go straight into our catch where it logs our error. So that actually handles everything for us. So now, now that we know our status is correct and we'll have the right data, we can go in here and grab products list equal to res.data. And so now we have this array of all these different objects. So if I scroll back up here, the, product, the properties that I want based on what our site has defined and is going to show is an ID, the title of the product, the seller, the URL where the image is located, and a price, a discount, and a description. Let's look and see what, uh, what they have. They have a category, we don't have a category, so we need to support that, or at least figure out what we're gonna do with it. They have a description and a title, which is great. They do not have a seller, so we're gonna have to do something about that. There is an ID, which is great. Um, there's an image, which this looks like a URL to the image for the product. Um, we just have it named something different, so we'll need to take that into account. They have a price and they have ratings, so how many ratings it has and what the overall average is. I think we can pretty easily add in support for the category, which would be useful. Uh, I think we're gonna leave ratings out just because this is a different feature that's a whole nother beast. Um, and then we'll need to add a seller, which I guess we can just randomly generate and we'll need to add our discount, which we'll also randomly generate. So one thing to note is that when you're working with an API, oftentimes the data will come back not exactly how you want it or not in a way that is beneficial for you designing your front end. Maybe the properties are called something a little different than what you've called it in the rest of your site. And so you'd rather just maintain consistency with what you have. Or in our case, there's properties that are missing or things that need to be changed, like our URL changing to image or the other way around. So let's go in and make those modifications. This is a pretty common practice. 
um, we're going to do res.data.map, and we're going to take all of the objects in our data array and map them into a new object that just looks a little bit different. So we can go ahead and take all the properties in here. That's fine. We'll just ignore rating. Um, actually, we're not going to do that. We're going to go top to bottom here. I'm going to close this. We have more space. So ID, this is the same as in the product. So we can keep that. Title is the same thing. Product.title exists. Description. Products.description. Um, seller. We do not have a seller. So we're going to make this to do. And uh, URL. We need to grab product.image. Uh, we're going to ignore rating. Let's grab the price, product.price, discount. Uh, we're going to make this zero, and this is also to you. What else? Description, price, where else? Seller, title. Let's grab the category. All right. So this looks good. We now have our products list and it has all of the data reformatted in the way that we like. And we can go ahead and return. Let's not return. Let's set this directly in a state variable. So our state variable is going to hold all of our products. Previously, we had been done it through use memo, which creates a variable that only updates when it needs to. Um, but let's make a state variable called products, set products use state, empty array. And down here, we can go ahead and call set products with our products list. Nice. So now we have this list. And let's make sure everything else can actually use this list that needs it. Right now, it's unused, which is why it has a yellow squiggle. So filtered products is when we take our original list, and then we filter it down based on search criteria. We took out our duplicated products, um, but we can replace it with just our products right here. All right, that looks good. And we also need to put it in our um, dependency array for this use memo. So anytime our products change, we need to refilter them. All right, this looks pretty good. It's going to show us our image and the title and the price and the seller which is all the stuff that we had defined in our product listing. We have some new properties now, though, and some things have changed. So let's add a couple of things in here um, just to make this look pretty. We have our title. We have our seller. Let's put the seller underneath the title and put it all together. Let's add it to do. Um, we'll just go ahead and add it directly for now product.discount and uh, let's add h6 product.category. All right, this looks pretty good to me. Everything is updated on here. It's really small, I apologize, but everything looks good. So let's let's go ahead and do some stuff with the discount and with the seller. We don't actually have that information, so let's randomly generate it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create another file here called um, randoms.js. And in here, we're going to generate all of our random things. This is starting to get pretty complex with a lot of different files. And so I'm going to go ahead and create a little bit of organization here. Let's create a folder for individual components, like our cart display, our product listing, our product table, and our search bar. Ideally, these are designed to be used in a lot of different places. So they're all components. And let's create another folder here for utils. And our utils can be where we generate all of our random stuff. Our cart is a utility 
thing that creates a context. It's not exactly a component. So I'm going to put it in here as well. Our listings page, that's kind of the odd man out. Let's create a page folder and we'll use this more next week. All right, so it looks like we've messed up all of our uh, imports. It didn't automatically update those. So we're gonna have to go ahead and do that ourselves. So what I'm doing here is I'm just going through and every time we import something from the path that's changed, take out the import and then re-auto import it. That looks good. Our cart doesn't have anything. Our listings page has changed. Our cart provider has changed. Our cart display has changed. All right, and that looks like the last thing. So take your time going through that if you need to. I'm gonna clear all this out. And let's go into our randoms and let's do a couple different things. So I'm gonna create a uh, first names list and make this an array with just a couple of first names. Let's call this Bob, Fred, and Joe. And let's make a last names list. You can put whatever you want in these. Um, let's call this Phillips, David, um, I don't know. And we need a function that's going to get a random name. So two things we need to do. We need to grab a random thing from our first name. And let's make this a semi-complicated math expression. So we're going to get math.random, which generates a random number between 0 and 1, but not including 1, importantly. And let's multiply this by our first names list. .length. So this will give us a number between 0 and 2.999999. And our indexes go zero to two. So if we just go ahead and call math.floor here, math.floor takes a decimal number and rounds it down, always down. And so this will round it down to zero, one, or two, since it can't possibly be three. This can't be one. It could be really close, but not one. And then we multiply it by three. And let's do the same thing here. last name, last names list. And once we have this name, we can go ahead and return it in two pieces. We'll make this a template string just for fun. But of course you can just concatenate these two together if you want. All right, so we have our random name. Let's go back into our listings page once we've done that. And let's replace seller with get random name. Oops. It's going to tell me that I haven't imported it because I need to remember to export this. We're going to have multiple things in here. So we can't export default. Export default means I'm exporting one thing and you can import it without giving it a specific name. But because we have a bunch of things, we need to give them named exports. And now, get random name from util.random. Nice. So now, um, 
it looks like we have a bug. Our name is currently just showing those indexes. I did this as I was lesson planning and I forgot about it. So we just grabbed the index and we didn't actually do anything with it. We need to grab first names list with that index and last names list with that index. All right, that looks a little better. Now they all have names for the sellers. Sweet. So our discount is still set to be zero. So let's deal with that next. I think our discount should be a random percentage between zero and 90. And we could make it uh, multiples of five. So what I think we should do here is um, if it's multiples of five, what we could do is we could generate um, a random number between zero and 19. So five times 20 is 100, but we don't want it to quite be 100. We could go up to like a 95% discount, but if it's 100%, then like, what are you doing? So let's generate a random number between zero and 19 and then multiply it by five. That way, if it's zero, zero times five is 0%, no discount. If it's 19, 19 times five is 95. And so we'll have a 95% discount. So let's also create a function in our randoms. Um, let's return math.random times 20. Again, this is zero to one, but not inclusive of one. So this will go from zero to 19.99999, so on and so forth. We can math.floor this to get our integer again. And then we multiply it by five and then it'll give us our discount. All right, we have this. So let's go back into our discount, get random discount. All right, so this is a 75% discount, 15% if I clear out all of this stuff. 15%, 95%, 90%. All right, this looks pretty good. I don't uh, love how this looks right now. Um, so let's add a couple of things here just to make this a little prettier. Normally, if I were looking at something, uh, this is not clear that this is a discount. This is not clear that this is the price. And it doesn't actually show us what the price is when we put it on discount. So let's do this really quick. It'll be five minutes. If anyone has to leave, you're welcome to. It's four o'clock. Um, but let's update our cart display to show things a little prettier. Not cart display, sorry, product listing. So our title, we don't really need to put anything in front of that. Our seller doesn't really stand out from the rest of this. I'm gonna make this an H, um, let's make this an H4. So it's big, but not quite so big. And let's make this an H2. All right, so these differentiate and then this stuff down here is also useful. Uh, so let's specify that this is the category. And let's combine this price and discount together. So let's do, if there is a discount, which it could be zero, let's cross out this price originally and then put the new price on the side and then in parentheses, our discount percentage. How about that? So let's, let's do a conditional rendering. If there's no discount, we don't wanna show anything special. We just wanna show the price. So if product, or we don't need an if statement, product.discount 
is equal to zero. Then we're going to render just this right here. And let's put a dollar sign in front. Otherwise, we're going to render something else. Let's make this a fragment for now, just so it stops yelling at us. Cool. So it doesn't show anything except for if there's no discount, in which case it'll show the price. All right, this looks pretty good. Um, I'm going to actually put a product category below because I think that looked better. Let's make this an H4 as well. All right, so now in this section, we're going to render if we do have a discount, that little piece. So let's make this an H4. And we have our, our product.price, which will be struck in, stricken through, and then product price times um, our discount is currently out of 100. So let's do product.discount divided by 100. And then in parentheses, product.discount. And we'll show that this is the percentage off. And if we're taking this percentage off, this calculates how much we're taking off. And we need to actually subtract it from our product dot price. All right. So we have our original price. That looks fine. We forgot to put our dollar sign in front. And we need a dollar sign in front of our new price. And there's a couple things. So we need to do our strike through really quick. Um, and so we're going to do that by wrapping this in a span. A span is like an invisible element, similar to how a div is invisible, it bunches things together in a box. A span allows us to invisibly select just a piece of text and then apply styling properties to it. So we can add the style property, which again, probably haven't done yet unless you're way ahead in the lessons, but we can add a property called text decoration. And then we're gonna call this strike through. Hmm, that didn't work. I thought that's what it was. All right, stand corrected. We need text decoration line and line through. Let's try that. Great, that looks better. That gives us our new price and how much it's off. This is giving us a hundredths of a dollar, which are thousands of a dollar, which we don't want. And so really quick, what we're going to do is we're going to do um, this value. We're going to put this whole calculation in parentheses. And then now this is a number, and we can call to fix, which says round it to a specific number of digits. It's always going to have two digits after the whole dollar. And that looks better. So now we have to the hundredths to the hundredths, and this is what we want. All right, this is everything that I had planned here. Line through, that's uh, how you do a strike through. It's a CSS property. And we could um, actually do cool stuff with this line too. Uh, I think if we do text decoration color, green, Did that work or no? Yeah, so now our line through is green. We can deal with all kinds of interesting text decorations. We're gonna leave it black then. 